The subject for the message today is, is on missions. Um, the title of the message this morning is The Sovereignty of God in Missions, and our text will be Ephesians 3, verses 1 to 13. At the London Olympics in 2012, there was a day that stood out for many. It was a day that became known as Super Saturday. It was the day when British athletes won gold in three different events, all within one hour. Greg Rutherford won gold in the long jump. Jessica Innes won gold in the heptathlon. And Mo Farrell won gold in the 10,000 meters. So perhaps imagine what it would have been like to have been in the stadium on that day during that hour, especially as a British supporter and with all of it happening in London on home ground. It must have been exhilarating. It must have been one of those sort of perfect moments, almost the stuff that dreams are made of. I'm sure no one who was there that day has easily or quickly forgotten that experience. And you yourself may have experienced something grand and something euphoric, something slightly historical even at some point in your time. I mean, we all long, don't we, to be part of something big, something we can tell others about, where we can say, do you know that I was there? And when we are part of something big like that, when we do share in it, we, we so often remember the details, don't we, of, of where we were and um, who we were with when it happened. Those things really stick with us. But I wonder how often as Christians we realize that we are part of something much greater than anything else and something that is happening every day. And that we're not just witnesses of this greatest thing ever, but in fact that we are participants in it. That we, in fact, yes, are part of the mission of God, living and sharing the greatest victory ever. And so today I want to talk about, as Niels and Esme go off to India, this glorious reality of the sovereignty of God in missions, and what that means not only for them, but certainly for every one of us as Christians today. So let's read together then Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 1 to 13. Paul writes, for this reason, I, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I've written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of His power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. That through the church, 
the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. There are three points that we can highlight that support God's sovereignty and mission in this passage before us. Firstly, and what is the overarching reality and the main focus in this passage is God's sovereignty in the gospel. You see, Paul here is reminding the Ephesians, the Ephesian believers, of the importance of the gospel and of Paul's own privilege and in their privilege of being a servant for it. And so what Paul is doing here is he is putting the gospel and his current role in ministry for the gospel in the context of the bigger picture of God's greater plan of salvation. And he's doing this to try and highlight for them, therefore, the great moment, the great position that they, that we, as the church today, are in. This passage you may have picked up centers around this description or phrase that Paul repeats, the mystery of God. What does he mean by that? Well, he does not mean mystery as in something spooky or without form. No, he's using the word mystery here as he explains in the sense of something hidden that has now been revealed. Something that was unknown and unclear, but that is now evident. Look at verse 4 and 5 again. When you read this, you will perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And so this mystery of God is something that God has been up to, something that God has been doing that was unclear and unknown, unrevealed, but that has now been made known to Paul by revelation and to many others. What is this mystery? Well, it is nothing other then God's plan of salvation now fulfilled. How God has now fulfilled His promise that He made from the beginning to redeem the world, to save mankind. That's what's now been revealed, how God would do that. Specifically, how God would crush the serpent's head promised in Genesis 3.15. How would God do that? It was a mystery back then. What was he speaking about? The seed of the woman who would come and do this. How would would God make Abraham a blessing to all the nations as he promised in Genesis 12? How would he do that? How would one man become a blessing to, to everyone in the world? More so, as you read the story of the Bible and it unfolds who God is and and what He is like, we're faced with this tension of, of how would God judge sin on one hand because He is holy, but yet on the other hand also show mercy because He is loving. It seemed He had to be one or the other. How would that come together? Well, it now has, Paul is saying. How would he, as the psalmist writes, be able to actually remove our sins as far as the east is from the west when the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away our sin? How would he do that? How would he be able to wash our sins? You know your sins. I know my sins. How would he be able to wash our sins, though they be like scarlet, wash them so that they would be white as wool? How would he give us a new heart? 
that we would now do what is right and love Him. How would He make one new people, as Isaiah speaks about, who would come together from all the nations to worship at the mountain of the Lord? That was the mystery. That is what was unclear and and unknown, but has now been revealed in nothing other than the gospel, which he makes plain for us then in verse 6. If you read that, he goes and says it. This mystery is this, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body as the Jews, and partakers of the promise of all that was given to Abraham and and all throughout the history of the Old Testament, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus now through the gospel. That's the mystery that has now been revealed of how God would save by sending His Son to live a perfect life, to die a perfect death, and to rise again. This gospel which he has made clear in the first couple of chapters leading up to this. Not least of all in chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. Where he's made clear that salvation is now therefore by faith alone. Through grace alone. In Christ alone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You know that verse well. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Which is what the whole mystery in the Old Testament was revealing, that we cannot save ourselves. We we cannot be good enough for God. We need a Savior. But who and how? Jesus, the gospel. It's it's what he's made clear already in in then the second half of chapter 10 as well, in verses 11 to 22, how, how all Jew and Gentile are saved the same way by faith and are then simultaneously included in the same body, the same people through Jesus Christ. Again, chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. But now in Christ Jesus, you, that is the Gentiles who were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility. That's how God would reconcile man to Himself and to one another in this glorious reality of the gospel through the life and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the mystery now made known which we take for granted because we live this side of the cross. But then, it was astounding. It really was revelation. It really was good news. And so this is so exciting. This is so overwhelming for Paul that even though here, then, as he begins chapter 3, he he, he seeks to express um, his his heart for the people in prayer in verse 1. That's where he begins, yet he he seems to stop mid-sentence. He he stops mid-sentence to unpack further the absolute wonder of the gospel and what it means for them, for their place now in history and the implications for their lives now and for eternity. I mean, did you notice that? Verse 1 just sort of stops in the middle. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, And then he digresses, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace. It's like he was going in one direction and suddenly he stops. He he was moving to pray for them, but he's so caught up in the glory of the gospel and this mystery now revealed that he he needs to speak more about it. Because we see then in uh, verse 14, he picks up where he was starting in verse 1 of chapter 3. Look at what's verse 14. For this reason... Begins exactly the same words that chapter 3, verse 1 begins with. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory He may grant you, etc. And so then finally, He gets back to praying for them. But surely this interruption highlights how important the reality of the gospel is, that He interrupts His prayer 
in this way. He wants us to not lose sight of the privilege and responsibility that is ours and for them that is theirs. And so what he is doing here then is highlighting for us how in and through the gospel, God's sovereignty over all history and for all eternity is made evident. How this plan that was hidden, this plan of God that was slowly unfolding, this plan of God that was step by step progressing over thousands of years has now been fulfilled, has now been accomplished. And it was an incredible feat. It was a, something that showed in and of itself God's unmatched power and unrestrained rule over all things in heavens above and on the earth below. That God accomplished what He promised. I mean, just consider for a moment the opposition that there was to God's plan and to Jesus coming and to the gospel. Just think of how from the very beginning the devil was at war against God seeking to destroy the seed that was promised to come and save. Starting immediately with getting Cain to kill Abel. And then a couple of generations on the brothers seeking to kill Joseph. And then 400 years later, Pharaoh seeking to kill all the Hebrew males under two. And then at at the end of the history during the time of Esther, Haman decreeing to kill all the Jews. And then the time of Jesus' birth, King Herod again trying to kill all the Jews under two. Think of the opposition of the powerful rulers to God's plan from men like Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar and Caesar. Think of man's rebellion that was opposed to God. Even in Noah's day, it required the flood sparing only one family. The Tower of Babel, which required God's judgment, sending all the peoples into great confusion with different language and scattering them over the face of the earth. Think of the rebellion of the people of Israel when they failed to trust God and enter the promised land after leaving Egypt the first time, and their subsequent judgment in the desert for 40 years. Think of those cycles of rebellion of the people of Israel during the time of the judges, how again and again they turned from God. Think of the division even of God's kingdom in the Old Testament of Israel into north and south. Think of the succession of evil kings over the people of Israel. From every side and in every generation, opposition And despite all that, God's plan remained perfectly on track. In fact, so much so that at the time of Jesus' birth, Caesar Augustus, the most powerful man in the world at the time, thought that he would flex his muscles and issue a census to see just how big his kingdom was, how much power he had. Yet little did he know that he was in doing that, but a pawn in God's plan, who had determined that this census should happen to ultimately serve his purpose and actually show how great God is. For it meant that Joseph and Mary would leave Nazareth and have to travel to Bethlehem to register there and so fulfill the promise by Micah, the prophet, hundreds of years before that God's ruler would come from the little town of Bethlehem. In fact, so much so that a Jesus coming into the world would happen when the Romans were in power. The Romans who practiced the horrific method of crucifixion for its criminals and victims. And so this meant that when the Jewish leaders, unbelievably, together with the Gentile leaders, plotted together and wickedly devise Jesus' death, which would be then by crucifixion, were two but pawns in the hands of God. As you see, they would unknowingly thus fulfill the promise that God had made thousands of years earlier in Genesis 3, 
that the enemy would strike his heel as the nails went through his feet on the cross. But that he, in his death on the cross, would crush the serpent's head. The very crucifixion of Jesus, which Satan thought was the final nail in the coffin of the promised seed he's been trying for thousands of years to destroy, was but God finally fulfilling his plan of salvation. As Jesus' sacrificial death provided the final means for eternal life for us and the ultimate demise of the devil, indeed crushing his head. And so Jesus could cry out on the cross, it is finished. What was finished? All the years, all the thousands of years of God's plan unfolding to send a Savior, to realize the gospel, finished, done, fulfilled. Curtain in the temple torn in two. A way, one way now open for all people to come to God, enabling Jew and Gentile to be fellow heirs and partakers of the promise. And so you cannot deny, in fact, one should be astonished and amazed at God's power to fulfill His plan of salvation through Christ, even as Paul writes in Galatians 4 verse 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent His Son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. And so the point of all this, the point that Paul is wanting them and us to realize is this then, that if God has been sovereign and successful over the greatest event in his mission, namely the sending of Jesus and the cross and the resurrection, surely, surely he is sovereign over all the subsequent mission that you and I are involved in. That if nothing could stop God's provision of salvation, then nothing can stop the progress of that salvation. It's as if the floodgates are now opened, and so all the ground below will be watered. You cannot stop it. It's simply inevitable. And so to add traction, to add hands and feet, to add proof to this truth, Paul then gives two other lesser examples of God's sovereignty in mission by highlighting God's sovereignty in his own life and by highlighting God's sovereignty in the life of the Ephesians and the church as proof of the unstoppable progress of the gospel because of God's almighty provision of salvation in the gospel itself. Consider then how Paul highlights God's sovereignty in his own life, the grace of God to him. He's amazed as you, as you read this passage, it is um, sprinkled with something of his own testimony and his own wonder that, that, that he is an apostle. I mean, how did he be, become the one who would end up knowing this mystery and more so being a partaker in this mystery and more so even being an ambassador of this mystery? As he says in verse 8, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. How did that happen? I mean, Paul was the epitome of pride. Paul was the greatest and most esteemed of the Pharisees. Paul was the leading persecutor of the church. This is the guy who killed Christians. And yet now he is the guy spearheading the expansion of Christianity throughout the Roman world then. How does that happen? I mean, who saw that one coming? No one. And so Paul's point is, is that just demonstrates, does it not, God's power, God's sovereignty, that he is able to turn anyone, any heart to himself. No one can resist. No one can hold back his hand. No one can stop the progress of God's mission. 
In fact, one could, could even say that is it not true that it can often seem harder to save those who think they are saved? And if anyone thought they were saved and going straight to heaven, first in line, it was Paul. And yet despite his self-righteousness, his self-deception, it was no match for God's power. And so this is great encouragement for us in our evangelism, in our mission, that God can save anyone. Paul's life is proof of that. And on the other side, too, it means that God can use anyone. But not only is God's sovereignty in Paul's life evidence of the fruits and the inevitability of the progress of the mission, but also the God's sovereignty in the church them itself. I mean, look at how he describes what the church is, certainly not least of all speaking even of this Ephesian church to whom he is writing in verse 10, of... of of who they now are, of, of what they now represent, of, of what they now stand for. Look at what he says in verse 10. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. It's an incredible statement. What Paul is saying is that them as the church and, and the church, wherever it is, is a local gathering of people throughout the world, stands as a powerful, undisputable witness and testimony to the success of God's plan of salvation. That now you have a bunch of sinful people reunited to God and reunited to one another. I mean, just consider the kind of people these Ephesians were. That they were pagans, they were idol worshippers. They boasted in the great shine of Artemis that stood in Ephesus. But yet this is what we read of them in Acts chapter 19, when Paul shared the gospel and first began the church. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. And so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Talk about evidence of radical repentance. Talk about evidence of something supernatural coming upon a people steeped in darkness, steeped in paganism and ritual. Now willing to burn all that, regardless of the great cost, in the sight of everyone. To see they're now serving a new king and living a new way and are part of a new people. And so Paul is saying, look at them. Look at the change in their lives. There's no other explanation for that but the power of God. And so the church then and today is the fruit, is the evidence. We are that the gospel is indeed the power of God unto salvation. In fact, he even says that their very existence tells not just the earth, but more so all the powers of heaven that our God reigns. It's made known to all the principalities and rulers in the heavenly realms that Jesus is Lord, that the light has dawned, that the sun has risen, that the new creation has begun. That's what we stand here as a testimony to as we gather and as we live week in, week out. As one writer says, so think about it. The stories of Abraham and Moses and David and the prophets come to their climax in your church as people from all nations come to the obedience of faith. And so the evidence in Paul's life and the evidence in the life of the existence of the Ephesians church and even us today is again proof that like a large boulder rolling down a hill, the progress of the gospel cannot be stopped in fact, it only gathers momentum. The battle is won. The victory is sure. God's kingdom will prevail. And so we are the display. We are the first fruits. 
of this glory of God that will one day cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. This is our confidence. This puts beyond question God's sovereignty in mission. And so here then are two examples among thousands of others of people getting saved today, of the gospel going out into the ends of the earth that illustrates the progress of mission because God is sovereign. Samuel Schwimmer was a great missionary leader of the 20th century, especially in the Muslim world. And he was nicknamed, in fact, the Apostle to Islam. Some of you may have read of him and know about him. And he wrote many booklets introducing Muslims to the message of Jesus. On one occasion, a Muslim teacher ripped one of these tracks into small pieces in front of his class. Intrigued by a message that provoked such anger, one of the imam's students gathered up the fragments and pieced it together. What he read led to his conversion. Another example, Tim Chester, current pastor and author in the UK, relays a story about one of his wife's colleagues. He writes, she loved hanging out with us as part of our gospel community, but she found the gospel message weird. We did some Bible studies with her, and, and she kept looking at us in astonishment, walking on water, rising from the dead, ascending into heaven. You believe all that stuff, she asked? Later, she told us that we seemed like sensible people who were able to hold down good jobs, but believed we were all crazy. But then she described one moment when she was sitting on the floor in her front room of her home, when suddenly, suddenly, she knew it was all true. Suddenly, she believed. In a moment, the Holy Spirit gave her faith, and she rejoiced in Jesus as her Savior. And so, we must look, in light of all of this, at what is the key verse in this whole passage. And what this whole passage builds up to is verse 13, this last verse. When we see how Paul ends... What does he say? He says, so, therefore, in light of all this, I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, because it is your glory. What is Paul saying? Well, he's applying all of this to them and encouraging them, saying, don't worry about my suffering, because as he began, he's, he's a prisoner. He, he's in jail. He's in prison for the gospel. He's, he's very much experiencing the reality of persecution for Jesus. But, but, but he's saying to them, in light of all this, you don't have to worry about my suffering. You don't have to worry about how things may appear. You don't have to worry about my circumstances. Because God is working, you see. God is absolutely in control that all this is happening, even me being in prison, is for your glory. It's, it's for your good. It's for your spiritual benefits. Don't worry. In other words, the gospel will prevail because as God is sovereign in the establishing of His mission in the gospel, so He is sovereign in the progress of His mission as we spread the gospel. And so for Nielsen, Esme, don't lose hearts, whatever you may face. That whatever you do for the gospel, God is using it for their glory. In some way or other, for the spiritual good of people in India. That, that He is sovereign, and that Jesus is one 
and that you are part of Mission Unstoppable. And so what we need to get is this, as John Piper writes in his seminal book on mission, Let the Nations Be Glad, the most crucial issue in missions is the centrality of God in all things. Because how can people who are not stunned by the greatness of God be sent out with the message, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, He is to be feared above all gods. So what we must realize is that missions is not first and ultimate, God is. This truth is the lifeblood of missionary inspiration and endurance. William Carey, the father of modern missions who set set sail to India from England in in 1793, said this, and express this connection. When I left England, my hope of India's conversion was very strong. However, amongst so many obstacles, it would die. Unless upheld by God. Well, I have God, and His word is true. Though I have been deserted, Though I have been persecuted, yet my faith, fixed on the sure word, would rise above all obstructions and overcome every trial. God's cause will triumph. And Papa concludes, So Carey and thousands like him have been moved and carried by the vision of a great and triumphant God. That vision must come first. And that's the vision that Paul puts before us in this passage of the sovereignty of God in mission. The missionary woman, as I conclude, Helen Rosevere says this, each of us is called by God and sent out to serve Him. It doesn't matter how far He sends you. It might be to your next door neighbor. Distance has got nothing to do with it. Do you hear that? And so you and I may not have been at the London Olympics in 2012. You may not have watched the recent Rugby World Cup final when South Africa became world champions for a record fourth time. In fact, you may not even care about that. You may not have seen the amazing sunset that everyone else seemed to catch and post amazing photos of on Instagram. But none of that matters. The only question that really matters is this is where were you when God was saving the world? Were you a part of that? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great confidence, the great assurance, the great privilege, the great joy that is ours in partnering with you in this greatest of all, this mission, of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, to having this treasure, albeit in jars of clay, but this treasure, this power of God unto salvation. And that we can have this confidence that ultimately it's not about us, not about us in our skill, not about us in our charisma, it's not about us in our expertise, Not about us in always having exactly the right words, doing things exactly the right way. It's about us being truthful. It's about us exalting Christ above all. 
It's about us holding out the word of life. It's about us ultimately looking to and finding our confidence in the gospel, that that being the power to save. Because that is a reminder of God's power. That is a reminder of God's sovereignty overall, not least of all in mission. That the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church, against your kingdom. No matter how bad things may seem, no matter how much war and persecution may prevail, no matter how militant some may be, no matter how subtle some may be, no matter how perverse and immoral some may be, no matter how deceitful and criminal some may be, nothing can hold back your hand. Because Christ is risen as King of kings and of Lord of lords. And he is busy putting every enemy under his feet. And one day when he returns, every knee shall bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, may you use us, O oh God, today that there may be thousands more who will bow the knee willingly. Who will bow the knee before Jesus returns in joy and submission and repentance and faith to Him as the only Savior, as the only hope for any of us, for now and certainly for eternity. Give us, O oh God, a vision, an apprehension, a realization, a passion of Your greatness, of Your glory, of your power and sovereignty over all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.